extraordinarily generous. I'm not sure what they're up to in total uh, in total grant awards is what I'll call them, purchasing things for teachers. I want to say this last round was upwards of $30,000 in teacher requests, so we are very appreciative. And obviously I don't want to leave out the other folks who regularly give to us. The Board of Trustees did their annual between twenty dollars and $25,000 that they give to teachers at Hopkins Academy. They fund teacher requests at Hopkins Academy. Obviously, they do the scholarships every year. And as uh, Paul said last month, the PTO has generously offered to donate a good share of the proceeds from the Share the Love event to the Athletic Fields Project. So we're grateful. And Mother's Club, who all those, all those weekly emails you get from me and every phone call you get is thanks to the Mother's Club for funding the notification system. That's great. That is great. Okay, um, 3B, River Valley Counseling Services. So I'm pleased to announce, say thank you to Miss Dan, Chelsea Dan, who is our licensed school adjustment counselor at Hopkins Academy. Prior to this work, Miss Dan worked for, uh, a, I, I'm not sure if it was River Valley Counseling, but for a private counseling a group that would go into schools and deliver their services on site in schools. She asked if we would consider doing this in Hadley. And so we met with folks from River Valley Counseling and we're prepared to move forward. We anticipate that in January, River Valley Counseling will have hired a counselor. And how this works is that these are entirely private counseling services. People might wonder, why would you do that during school hours at school? One of the reasons is that if you are somebody who has a child that utilizes private therapy services, you would know that the 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. appointments get gobbled up like that. So the wait lists for children to be seen are very, very long. And how this works is that Chelsea would, Miss Dan would identify students who might benefit from additional outside of school counseling services. This is not our employee. This is this is essentially River Valley Counseling coming in for one day during the week, setting up shop, billing insurance. This is all in the referral process. Miss Dan connects the parents to River Valley Counseling. The parents fill out all the necessary paperwork, indicate this is something they would like for their child, and then it allows us to bring the services to the family rather than having families waitlisted for long periods of time. So that will start with Hopkins. That should start about mid-January or as soon as River Valley Counseling has hired somebody specifically for our school. West Springfield Public Schools does this. East Hampton, I believe, has a service in all of their elementary schools. Uh, we'll start with Hopkins and then we'll be looking to see if this is something that uh, there's a need for at Hadley Elementary as well. We're very excited about that. Good question. So I'm assuming that counseling services are being provided to students yes. only? Yes. Not, not me. I mean, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, might be wondering, but, uh, yeah. So they're, they are a public counseling service, but they're offering this service to children in the school. 
Um, they're a private counseling service. Oh, yes. yes. So they're a private enterprise. River Valley Counseling has offices, but they are coming into, they will hire an employee specifically for us. That employee schedule will be determined based on the need that we have. And that employee, all we do is provide, facilitate the referral process and getting the form signed, and we provide space for that person. That sounds convenient. Yeah, I just, I wasn't sure if you were saying that there was any possibility of non-students being seen for counseling services. No, these are 100% oh. our students Got it. Be, who would be referred. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? That was good. All right. Does that require any kind of approval or no, I don't think okay. so. It's just okay. programming. I just wanted to let you know we'll have flyers out in Hopkins Academy soon, and um, I'll send you an electronic copy of those flyers as well. Okay. All right, 3C, FY20, budget parameters and timeline, update from tri-board meeting from the 5th of December. Right, so I went to the tri-board meeting, and uh, one, the expectation is that we would have a preliminary budget to the town that doesn't mean every single line finalized it really just lets them know what's the change in total operating that we project and what's the change in local contribution that will be due to the town on the 29th so you'll see more detail on the 28th but we've told the town these numbers are very 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 preliminary so I did provide you with a handout Chris and I were looking at projections today if you were to ask us right now in this moment what we think would happen next fiscal year, we would project an increase of just shy of $200,000 in total expenses, which is 2.38%. So that's that's not tremendous sticker shock. That's good. It's, it's within the land of reason, but I want to underscore again. So here are the assumptions. Personnel, utilities, fuel, contracted services, level service, not level funded. So people move, step, salary, lane changes. They move what we know about what utilities costs, fuel costs, um, and other contracted services. We've had to make estimations about our uh, future bus contract. Materials, supplies, and equipment, level funded. We maintain those at level funding. We wanted to see what kind of increase we were looking at by doing this. So before asking people to kind of create more of a wish list. We wanted to see just how much does it cost us to keep our contracted services at the same level that they're at now. The available data we have now, we know our increases in all of our bargaining units. Uh, we don't know that for bus drivers, but we do know it for just about every other group. We have two unit A retirements, so we know that we have these two unit A retirements. Uh, we know, unfortunately, that the the health grant, the elementary and secondary health services grant, we know that will discontinue next year. We have applied for the new grant. The new grant is a different grant. So we've been using these funds to support, to offset the cost of nursing services at Hopkins Academy. And we know that the grant that we've applied for, one, it is highly competitive and focused on bringing resources to urban districts. And we know that it is not designed to support the same things we've been using the grant to support. We also know that the pre-K grant, we've been talking about this for a while, does not exist in FY20. We have five students graduating from Smith Vocational, five current seniors. We know we have one special education tuition eliminated because we had a student last year that moved out of district after April 1st. So if something happens after April 1st in terms of moving out of district. We own that, or any district, if somebody moves after April 1st, the district they were previously living in owns all those costs for the, the next fiscal year. So we know that that, even though that student has moved, that that cost will come off next year. They, they're not here now, but based on the law, we pay for it for this entire year. Mm -hmm. um, so what don't we know? We don't know the salary placement of the two new hires, minimal two new hires for the retirees. We don't know our busing contract, and that means both with our employees, the collective bargaining agreement, because that's up for renegotiation. We also don't know our, our contract. We use a, 
currently five stars, the one who bid and was awarded that contract, but that contract is also up. So we don't know that for next year. Vocational tuitions. So we know who's graduating, but it's very early for students to start having their Smith vote applications in and the tuitions have not been posted yet on the Department of Elementary and Secondary website. Those probably won't be posted for another two months at least. So I say even the January 29 number is still very, very preliminary. We do not know special education tuitions. So we based this increase, we just assumed that nobody's moving out and nobody's moving in and we eliminated the tuition that we knew was coming. Costs that we know will go up, changes in contracted services starting in the summer. We made those adjustments if we knew it. But for the most part, if anybody moves in before April 1st, and that's an out-of-district tuition, that's something the district has to absorb in their budget. Um, we don't know the cost of out-of-district tuitions for next year. Operational Services Division posts those prices. You can find them online. They have not posted FY20 prices yet, so we just are using FY19 prices. We don't know what circuit breaker will be reimbursed at. We assumed a 72% reimbursement. We have no idea if that's what it will be. And of course, we don't know if there'll be significant changes to individual education plans. We don't know any of that. And so you get this number. That's, that's a reasonable best yes given the things that you know are fixed and the things that you know are in flux. You know. Any questions on that? And so what are the next steps of the town? What do we need to tell them? So what you'll see in January is you will see refinement here if we have more information. What the town really needs to know is change in total operating and they're gonna zero in on local contribution. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately because of the decrease in grant funding, local contribution may not have the same rate of increase that total operating does. But they'll get that information. We'll give, uh, we'll have a school choice estimate for you as well, but it's very much an estimate. Uh, we don't have the adjustments even for this fiscal year. They haven't been deposited yet. And that information, really the town will get the projected change in total operating change in local contribution, and the list of knowns and unknowns, really underscoring for them that there is a lot that can change between now and even April 1, particularly when you're talking special education tuitions. Now, how much understanding is there within the rest of the tri board about the grants that we've received over the past years that we're no longer receiving that will make up for that difference in uh, local contribution? I, yeah, I, yeah, I think they do understand, and I, I feel as though when we go and present to them, so this year we'll present again to the finance subcommittee, the finance committee, and I don't think we'll do a separate finance committee and select board. They might ask us to do that. We work really hard to provide visuals and graphs and really explain that to them, and they're very receptive. They understand why these things happen. The problem is understanding why doesn't necessarily change the reality. I do know that the town, the town of Tribord also talked about having a process where um, they almost, they described it as kind of each department would take its turn at, well, the language that was used was you would be level funded until it was your year not to be. Now, I wanna be, I'm gonna make the assumption that that people probably mean level service. It does not seem logical to me because level fund means you're cutting, 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 and then what, you know, every five years you're gonna try to play catch up doesn't, it, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. They're just trying to think through a budget cycle right now. They're having that conversation. So those two grants, uh, the ESHS and the pre-K, about 95,000? So 30, yeah, there's 40, 51 in ESHS that we use yeah. for offset to the, right. uh, to the local budget. 51 in that and 30. It's 30 for the pre-K. Yeah, so um, at that 81. Out of that 51, actually about 39.6 is used for a nurse's salary. The rest of it is... Oh, additional grant activities. That's yeah. Right. So that's right. So more like seven. So the two point something percent increase reflects offsetting the loss of grants. Well, it reflects that, but what what it's not showing you, we 
we, we did this purposefully because it's not time to sound any sort of alarm. The 29th is what you do. You're going to see that more in the change to local contributions. So those grants are gone. We say, here's, here's the, the budget. Here are the revenue sources that we use to fund the budget. Circuit breaker, school choice, grant funding, revolving accounts, and local contribution. Take out one of those. The other things we can't make go up anymore. And also with special education. So the upside is, it looks like we'll have a slight downward tick. If nothing changes, we would have a downward tick in out of district tuitions. It means less circuit breaker. So then, now local is getting potentially larger. But we'll keep you posted. This is, this is the starting point. Yeah. So at least it's not bad news before bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on, on top of the schedule. Oh, of course, of course. We're happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. He's the one that looks like crazy on all that. All right, anything else on the budget piece for FY20? No, I think the next part is connected to that. Yeah. Uh, finance committee suggestions for meal prep. Right. And I was invited to finance committee. I went and two things, two ideas came up. They just in general wanted to always they want to better understand the schools, what the schools' needs are, what are the things that are, are we looking at everything we could possibly be looking at in terms of cost savings and revenue generation. So two questions that came up. One was, have we ever considered consolidating our meal prep to one site and delivering meals? And the other question that came up was athletic fees. So I'm gonna start with athletic fees. And I'll let Chris talk about the meal prep analysis. So on the athletic fees analysis, and I, I didn't bother to put something in your packet because this is, I just ran an example. I asked, the athletic director, Mr. Sevick, give me last year's roster. And I took last year's roster and I said, all right, there are 142 unique athletes. And then I looked at the entire roster. And I said, if we did, and I think this is what you said Ware does, but this is what I did. If we said, you pay $100 for every sport you play. You're a three season athlete, 300 bucks. You've got three kids in your family, we do have a family. They don't play all three, but they're all athletes, $900. And we might make some adjustments. I assume we'd make adjustments in accordance with free and reduced lunch. So what happens if you just do that? So now you're not looking at individual athlete cap. You're looking at you play a sport, you pay. How much money would you generate? And if you backed out, this is last year's roster, if you backed out some free and reduced lunch, you come up with about $21,000. I'm not saying that's anything to sneeze at, you come up with $21,000. If you took the unique athletes and you said $100, you, you can play as many sports as you want at each athlete. It's not a family cap, it's an athlete cap of $100. Now you're coming up with closer to about 13 if you back out some free and it's about $13,000. And again, I'm not implying that any of this is small money. I'm sharing, I, I'm gonna share my opinion with you. I told finance committee, they heard my opinion without that analysis. I said I would absolutely provide an analysis and bring it before the school committee. And I don't, there's nothing to vote on tonight. It's just thinking about things. They asked us to think about these things. I also asked a parent of an athlete in the district, of a couple of athletes in the district, just one parent. But I said, I, I just want to run this idea by you. The parent sent me an email and said, I think that this idea would fail to take into consideration a few things, not the least of which is you may have students who actually elect to go to a lower division school, but they know that athletics are a part of the program. They're not charged for those athletics. Um, they're not charged to participate. And you're not taking into consideration that families actually already pay for it. And this parent went on to list everything that this family buys for their child around athletic season, from whatever it is, from a, a equipment to shoes to that it isn't, even if it's free, it's still not free for a family to have a child participate. And so this particular, just one parent, but just had very strong feelings about the message that it would send and feeling that the community 
is already so generous and so supporting and supportive and supportive of school department budgets that it just it didn't go over well it's one one piece of feedback that's not a focus group or anything else and i will say that that personally i feel that the amount of revenue you generate i'm not certain that it would offset some of the ill will that might come with it and um, i i worry that students who now granted if we were looking at free and reduced lunch we might say we're going to scholarship some folks that creates a management piece but that's all right you see how much time we spend chasing down collecting fees around lunch it, it's a lot of work to collect fees um, I, but there are families that don't qualify for free and reduced lunch. It doesn't mean that they don't experience economic hardship. We certainly hear about this around field trips where families ask for support and for help. Um, there are a lot of families that, that it, there's a struggle to keep things afloat. And so I do fear that it would have a negative impact on participation. And, um, and then we'd have to consider the scholarshiping part of it some folks have said, well, would, you have a very generous boosters club, wouldn't they just do it? The boosters already support athletics a great deal, with uniforms and other things. I, I, don't, I don't want to speak for them, nor do I think it's their job to scholarship athletes. And they, they provide a lot for all the athletes rather than singular athletes in terms of buying. So that's just my opinion, and I mean this sincerely, my opinion really doesn't matter on this. If this is something that the school committee were interested in pursuing, we could certainly um, continue the conversation or uh, assume that it, or factor that into the budget for next year. But I just wanted to let you know that that's one of the things they asked. That's the analysis I did on last year's roster. We're using those two scenarios. It could be a gazillion other scenarios. The range of revenue is somewhere between around 13 to around 20. So in other districts, where would athletic, that have athletic fees, where do those fees go directly towards the operating budget of the district? Or so is they it go to the athletic revolving account. Athletic revolving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which right now we're at 5900 and it's been pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just not sure what that extra money would be used for. I'm, I'm hearing your pros and cons, right? And, and so I would see, I would need to see a really compelling reason to set up that financial barrier. Just I worry about, I, I think about right now how there are some sports where it's tough to field middle school, junior varsity, and varsity right. teams, right? So you have three teams competing in the same sport, you add a fee on top of that, and now folks who might have you know, tried out for middle school might not with right. if, if this were a financial barrier. Like it might be even more incentive to not participate, like you said, and then now you're really not able to even support a middle school or a JV team potentially. And just from the equity standpoint, increasingly parents with means, privilege, uh, are um, getting above and beyond um, services for their child in, in terms of travel teams for soccer, mm -hmm. baseball, uh, you know, really every sport. It's even you know, beyond the regular season. Uh, and I, I think that while we'd like to think people might ask for a scholarship, I think there are a lot of people that would uh, not, just not show up. Absolutely, just absolutely. Up. And I, I think it's a, a public, like a, a public school should make it equally accessible to all students. <coughs> My job is to bring it to you for discussion. If you want to continue it at any point in time as we move through the budget, let me know and let me know what you want from us. But I, um, had assured the finance committee that I would let you all know that they had asked about that. And if you're all right with that, I'll turn over. The other question was... Okay, so one more question. Of course sorry, fees. What, um, what would be the athletic director's opinion on the fees? Has, has he weighed in on it? He has, yeah. casually. Okay. And he said, first and foremost, he said, I do not think we should be asking the boosters to make it possible for individual students to play sports. Right. And um, he... I don't know, I'm surprised by this, feels that athletics are a part of the entire curriculum. I mean, yes, we call them extracurricular, but it's a vital part of the child's educational experience, and that there should be nothing that gets in the way of that. I guess I would just be, I would just be interested in knowing, like, if, 
if this money were to be raised, like what it would be going towards, and also how this compares to any fees for any other extracurriculars. Like, are there other extracurriculars that there are fees for now, as opposed to, and what, while there aren't fees for sports and stuff, not having a child in that is, I'm not aware. So, so just maintaining that equity. So no, unless ski club, the costs associated with actually participating in the ski club, uh, some equestrian clubs, mm -hmm. and uh, do know that in some cases, if it's a co-op sport, like hockey, co-ops or hockey, there's some sports where you co-op that there's a fee associated with co-oping, but not here, you're doing this sport. Does any of the transportation costs offset by the athletic revolving fund? Just thinking about you know the cost for buses and oh, yeah. yeah currently not really no um, they uh, I, I believe they cover the cost of the renting of the van for golf mm -hmm. and the ball mm -hmm. so that that's covered by it um, but no I mean a large portion of the athletic revolving in the last year was used for the scoreboard in the gym yeah. I mean that was that was big yeah that was I, I don't remember the cost now but I'm thinking it was between $15,000. So. And that was accompanied with a donation. Correct. Correct. It was. So, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, it, it was used for, for items like that. Typically, it's used more for the betterment of the program mm -hmm. than the support of the program. Yeah. Uh, that's most likely how it is in, in all districts, quite mm -hmm. honestly. And I think FinCon is thinking that it would be used, you're asking what it's for. I think they're thinking that it would be used to offset the local budget. Yes, um, not as an enhancement. Yeah. They're looking at that. The other thing that parents said was, parents also pay to go to games, and for some families that's a lot. <laughs> they aren't expecting it, so they pay to go to games. People might be less enthusiastic about working the gate and volunteering. You know, they're paying for their children to do this. Those are two different points that they're making. Yeah, not we don't just pay for away games. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Correct. So idea number two was centralized food prep. That's all right. That was another question that was asked. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, in your packages you have a, a little analysis of that. Um, I met with Diane Zach, who's the food services director. Um, we went through what her needs would be if we centralized the food prep and then delivered it to each school. Uh, it, there's a unique set of circumstances here that really make neither uh, place to be the place to prepare food. Um, Hopkins has old equipment and larger cooler and freezer, which as you know is failing. Uh, <laughs> the elementary school has newer equipment but smaller cooler and freezer, so we run into those issues where it's like, boy, if we could take them both together we might have something, but of course you really don't want to do that because, you know, it's that's not a good idea to start tearing apart kitchens. That's the costs in itself that aren't even in this analysis. Um, there are some startup costs if we were to do the um, centralized food prep. I didn't really find those to be all that important because I guess if, if we were able to find a location to do it, we wouldn't be making these kitchen improvements that we need to make at Hopkins. So, you know, those costs would essentially be washed out by the lack of the kitchen improvements. So either way, they'd be covered. Um, but the downside is that we would end up needing to hire a driver. Uh, we would need to have the cook work additional hours because he would be working breakfast and lunch hours. And of course, the, the to-go containers that we'd be using now instead of the trays that we currently use here. So there's a cost involved with those to-go containers as well. As you can see by the uh, by the analysis, we'd actually lose about ten thousand dollars a year uh, if we were to centralize this versus what we're doing right now. It's six o'clock. Not to mention all the waste. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yes, I mean, you know, if if that's something that concerns you, and I'm sure it is, you have that as well. Yeah, where all of a sudden you're taking however many lunches we serve in a day, there's that many styrofoam containers that are going onto the, the landfill. So that would be a show to stop with the styrofoam itself for right. us to start to contribute to our landfills. Yeah. We'd have to look at another vehicle, like another medium. Yeah, which increases cost. Right, some right. kind of compostable plastic or cardboard. Yeah. 
it's certainly logical for people to say, well, wait a minute, why is this spread in Springfield and not Hamlin? So obviously, the larger you are, the more you save on scale. And you only have two places. So savings come because they consolidate now. They have a lot more personnel. Right? You're doing this with five elementaries. So the opportunity for savings is that much greater than when you're in a small place. So it's not overly surprising. But it's a logical question, and I promised him how we would do the analysis. But it's not surprising that the savings. Yeah. I do have one question um, about uh, savings. I know we've started farming out our pizza, and the kids are thrilled about the quality of the pizza. So I wonder whether that as a strategy has been considered uh, farming out more of our meals and whether that produces the savings in any way. There are some districts that use an external vendor uh, for all of their food. As far as I know, we have not looked into that here. You know, it's something we can certainly take a look at. Or do we do we purchase from local farms? Local, mm -hmm. I mean, we do. Yes. Okay, does a lot yeah. of that. She's yeah, really big on that. Yeah, she's big on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want to see us lock into one vendor. Um, but what would it look like if we? Had, you know, a contract with Chipotle for our Thursday burritos, and you know, another vendor for Friday pizzas, and yeah, I mean, right over there is the Domino's pizza poster. Right. So, <laughs> so and I, I forgot what day it says it's coming this week, but yeah, I'm Friday. sure the kids like yeah, that. Yeah, the kids love it. Yeah. So that might also increase our receipts of that. So that's a great idea. We can talk to all the time. Thank you for following up on the suggestions. And I think you know it's great that the finance committee is offering up some suggestions mm -hmm. to explore. And uh, you know, I, I hope that they continue to do so in the interest of we're going to you know find something that may work very well. You know, mm -hmm. but it's good to know kind of the impact of these these things um, at this point. Okay. Anything else on that? Mm -hmm. All right, radar data. So I'm not taking these girls. <laughs> thank, thank the Lord, right? I'm not. Why I think this is important. Not a lot of school committees go through radar data. These are all public. You can find these publicly on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website. In January, you'll get some specific special education radar data that is not public data, but Pam and I will present that to you as part of like looking at special education, um, where we're investing, where, where we're headed programmatically. Also, these data will be used for the new report cards. The accountability report cards are going to change, and those will be coming out probably next month. We'll get them and be sending them out to families. And there'll be a lot of financial data on those report cards about schools and districts. The new report cards try to draw folks' attention to really is more for larger districts and they have several elementary schools. And if there's a disparity in spending, why? Why is one elementary school spending more than another elementary school? What is helpful about, I think, the radar data is it gives you a sense of what Hadley is, for example, spending in per pupil. That first graph that you're looking at, I selected districts. The next two graphs, the Department of Ed says, these are districts that we think are demographically similar to you. But I chose mostly Pioneer Valley. The top three, Linux, that outlier in the Berkshires, is because it's also one of the districts that the department thinks is like Hadley. Um, and because they were out here in Western Mass, I put them in here. And in a rural population, non-dense area. Uh, so you can see, no real surprise there, that but for the most part, per pupil spending goes down when enrollment goes up. Amherst is a bit of an outlier there, but um, typically, and that has to do with the fact that you obviously have more bodies to spread fixed costs over. So that's what drives your per pupil spending down. Sometimes I know you all are asked questions also about what we're spending per pupil and how it compares to other districts. The Hadley and state context, there's nothing surprising on this graph, but it really demonstrates what happens in small school districts with declining enrollment. So if you look at the expenditures per in-district pupil, 
which is on the right hand side of that second from the top, Hadley's the orange line, you see that our expenditure per in-district pupil is less than the state average. Um, below that, you see the Chapter 78 per foundation enrollment is way below state average. That Chapter 78, that connects to low enrollment. And so you see we're way, way over here. And it also connects with our, on that first graph, you noticed Hadley's, what the department considers its relative wealth. So the only one that exceeded us was Lennox. And uh, otherwise, Hadley was the top of all the pioneers, 102%. <coughs> so part of foundation, part of your chapter 78 is determined by what you can do locally, what the state thinks you can do locally based on wealth, based on property tax income. So our chapter 78, much lower than the state average and so no surprise beneath that that what we're actually spending on pupils versus over what we're required to spend is higher okay. that locally we end up closing the gap so this shows you and of course you can see in enrollment we're very very much in the small schools um, uh, at the axis of that The radar data also gives you an indication of what the trends are. Now keep in mind when you're looking at changes over five years and all of those snapshot photos on the next page, that that would be FY18, so last year's data. That collection points that you're looking at, it's always October 1. The final one <coughs> is 10-1-17. Our 10-1-18, I want to say, is 536, slightly higher. Um, you can also see I've been talking about English language learners and you see this decrease of 19%. Where the 19% comes from is obviously not the difference in the percentages, but from the actual enrollment numbers below that. That's where the percentages are derived from. Um, and as I've said to you, our 10-1-18 count, we're much closer to 30 English language learners. So next year there'll be a big spike in that. And you see on expenditures by source of funds, um, one thing that stands out there is you can see that we are, you know, there's been an uptick in the use of revolving funds that has to do with using more school choice is essentially what they're looking at there, and pre-K revolving, um, and grant funding, um, although it was never a huge part of our budget, so it's hard to visually see that, but that band is actually slightly less. You can see that it's decreased so. Interesting to see the student enrollment go down 15%, it says. Whereas the state is there and the student with disabilities at 32 English learners down 19%. But you said that's going to go up. That's soon. going to go up again. So again, that 19% represented a change of four students. Nice. So the percentages on that are a little misleading because we have such a small that's, population. Yeah. It's going to go up by quite a bit next year. Right. Uh, probably like 40%. So actually. we're down almost 100 students. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, which is one of the things that I have to talk to you about. Uh, our per pupil, the per pupil in district, so these are students who are being educated in district, not out of district. Um, you see again what we're spending per pupil, that reflects the data on the first page. And then you see what we're spending percentage-wise by category. Um, and so most of our spending is in teachers. Uh, followed by benefits and fixed cost, and then you see where we fall out in terms of these other districts up here, these mm -hmm. other blue circles, where we end up. What are pupil services? So, predominantly, I think special education. Okay. Uh, and then it gives you the actual amount in the following page percentage and actual amount for us and for comparison districts, how we're spending versus how other districts are spending. And this is when you take each one of these categories and distribute it over your enrollment. As your enrollment goes down, then those, the amount you spend per pupil in a particular category goes up. And I'm sorry, I said people services, services as special education. I, I apologize for that. I'm thinking in terms of what we think of 
In terms of the end of year report, sorry, it's on the next page. My apologies. The tenants, parent liaisons, so it's listed there for you. Transportation, food services, so not direct services. I was thinking we always say uh, people services director in special education. So where do you so think that support. cost comes from? It seems higher for us than other places. So when you say it seems higher for us, you're looking at the percentage that we're spending on, or actually we're toward the top in that, Per correct? people, yeah. yeah. Um, so part of that comes from these things, all of these things that are listed here. Well, transportation is probably your bus contracts the most expensive, but for the most part, these usually aren't your most expensive things. Think of wages and food services. Think of wages in your own transportation department if you do it yourself. So if you're in Belcher Town and you have 2,000 children and you distribute those costs over that many children, how much you're spending per pupil is going to be direct. You might overall be spending a great deal more, but you have far more students over who can distribute those okay. costs. Uh, the staffing is, um, this is helpful because it's not total staff, it's per FTE. What's interesting in that though is again, if you think, so if you look at a lot of our staffing categories and you say, wow, we're, if we look like a district that has much higher enrollment, then that means they have far more of those people, right? Because this is per, FTE is per 100 students, right. right? So we might look like on leadership, so I'm gonna use Belcher Town again as an example because I know they have one of the highest enrollments in that group. We might look like in terms of leadership like Belcher Town, but they're looking at our 529 kids versus 2,000 kids. Right. So when you look at the per people cost on that people service, people services is still like the third highest yeah. of the uh, of the per student cost. So it'll be yeah. yes, it's similar more to what it? Yeah, it, does it get yeah. down anymore to like um, so breaking that down? Pupil mm -hmm. services like these categories, thirty one hundred through thirty six hundred, kind of where that um, per pupil eight one thousand eight hundred dollars is coming from. We can get it from our end of year report. Yeah, but not they don't they don't have the breakdown for us right here. Okay. But we can access the data that we actually provided them. Uh, what we were spending, what we spent. Yeah. In each of those subcategories on any given year. It'd be interesting to know maybe whether mm -hmm. it really is, you know, transportation or if it's mm -hmm. food services. I know it's on fifteen thousand dollar negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I'm just like we can certainly look into provide additional data and part of the reason you're getting this now is these are the kinds of things when we look at our budgets like the questions that I attach to the beginning of it are ways that you can look at the budget and ask yourself, yeah. okay, is this making sense? Mm -hmm. uh, our, I'm going to take you to our special education enrollment. Uh, under special radar bench marking special education enrollment. So you can see that we're below the state average um, in special education. And in our comparison districts, um, I guess I'd say we're right. Actually, we're probably on the lower end in our comparison districts. So there's a couple. There's Linux is below us, but then Granby and South Hadley are about right where we are, and most of the rest are a bit higher than we are in terms of special education. Percent of students identified as having disabilities, as being eligible for special education. Proportionally, we still have a, a number out of districts. Mm -hmm. higher compared to some other yeah. similar districts. Is that something that, um, is, are those uh, students that we're not able to serve yet here that we are Correct. continuing and the to number, try to keep Yeah, and the number has actually gone down. So yeah. the last, what you see here out of district, so their last collection point, the 10 one we mm -hmm. had 10 students in out of district placements. And our 10, excuse me, 10 one we had 10. This year, 10 one, 18, we have six, 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 six. So it has decreased. I don't think this one is down proportionally, actually. So that percentage would might be reflected also by our total student population as well, mm -hmm. right? 
So given the fact that we have a smaller student population, any out-of-district placement is going to have a greater effect on our numbers. You would want to look at who's small like us. I mean, um, Hatfield is smaller than us. Um, so there's a big difference between us and Hatfield. We look kind of like Granby. Granby's mm -hmm. a little larger than us. But uh, again, Belchertown's much larger. Amherst is larger than New York. Yeah. Okay. So that's not done. That one isn't done like per FTEs. They, it's not done. Got Fortunately, it. that one yep. is done. It's not done per Okay. Yeah. Um, and then what does our um, students with disabilities population look like? Uh, how many of the, how many students are we talking about? Where are they, where might they be uh, a part of what we would call two subgroups of students? So students with disabilities and English language learners. What does our population look like in special education? And then what are we looking at in terms of special education staff? And you can see here uh, that we have had, we had a big spike in special education paraprofessionals and that's when we developed an in-house program with the goal of bringing students back into district. And so we have a classroom, you guys approved that a couple of school committee meetings ago, where we do have ratios of it's not even one to one, so you have a teacher that's not counted into that. So we have students who have a dedicated educational support professional um, with them. And that's where you see that, that spike in special education paraprofessionals. Um, so there's just an overview of radar data. I'm not exactly sure which of these data will show up on the report card, but uh, this is all of the data that they would possibly pull from for the new district report cards and school report cards. And this again was, I typically annually, I want to provide you with these data before we get the budget. So far, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I sense of the budget. Um, I'm gonna say my two things quickly and then we done with them if I cut them off. That's okay, my two add-ons. Yeah, your okay. HR manager and open house. Yeah. The town is looking at an HR manager director. What I'm prepared to say to to David in an email and to Christian Stanley, who often comes to these meetings on the select board, is that this because they're looking for someone to build their capacity in recruitment, retention, um, onboarding, and, and ongoing professional development, discipline, and dismissal that we don't need support with that. We have access to an attorney that's on a retainer. We run everything by the attorney. We don't need support with that. If they are interested in asking us how we might take on some of the things they currently do for us, benefits management, we're happy to have that discussion and see if we can take some of those things back over on the school side to free them up. But um, my position is that we don't need, we would not be accessing the HR directly. Why that matters is um, you may be asked when you're at these meetings about this. And, and I've said that the town wants to look closely. If they hire somebody and they portion out cost to the school department, and that goes into our end of year report, they've apportioned these costs out to us, that drives up that actual net school spending above required. That percentage would also apply to our charter tuition. So I'm not saying it wouldn't be nice to have extra help, but I'm saying I, I wouldn't recommend that. I feel like they'd be paying for it twice on the school. Mm -hmm. It's not something, a critical need for us. Um, they may very well have that need. That's a message I plan to give, unless you felt um, differently about that. It's, it's not for me to decide, but that's where, and Chris and I talked about this, that's where we land on this. I would think only if in the future, if there were some contract request for, you know, that's management or to help have somebody like that to bank. Anything like that that has come up in the past is it would need management. Maybe that's a, a future idea, yeah. but it doesn't sound like currently there is that need. No, I, I, but, I don't feel as though there is. Thank goodness we have a great great access to great human resources legal counsel. Right. It doesn't charge us every time we call. Um, sis, uh, I should have said with the radar and perhaps you merit this is something that really might come up when you're at CES. The radar reports also show us that this question of sustainability, which you brought up many times, Paul, all of you have, is really a pressing issue when you look at the enrollment, what that does in terms of per people expenditures and, and actual net school spending. 
we're not alone in this. Um, John Robert and Hatfield will be retiring in June of 2020. Um, as part of his exiting, he's really working with the school committee to look at sustainability. I was also approached by another school uh, superintendent in Franklin County to say, what should we be talking about? When the superintendents last met, the, CBF, uh, the CES superintendents got together for one of our meetings. We also were clear that these are really conversations that should happen among elected officials. Like you, you do not want your superintendent to be the face of exploration of any sort of consolidation. You want to uh, so that's really about elected officials. Uh, and we asked if CES might talk to, since we all have board members, school committee members, that maybe there might be some energy around creating a, a working group at CES to start thinking about these things as, as a kind of a school committee working group. So you may hear about that when Bill Deal. Um, there's a lot of interest in this group. And, um, Lastly, uh, even though we don't have enrollment to try to get this, I told you we're looking to have an open house that's focused on bringing kids in, bringing families in. So um, that's still in its planning and we hope to have that. We, it, that will happen. That's great. That's great. Great. Yeah, that's all me. Paul, do we need to move your CTA yeah. him up earlier? Sure. Or do we need to leave? Yeah, I do. Uh, okay, let's do, if you don't mind, Chris, uh, CPA request. Mm -hmm. Paul. Let me take that away. Yeah. Well, it's, I guess it's both of you. Um, so this is re related to the athletic fields, and um, thank you again to the PTO mm -hmm. for its offer to contribute. As Annie said, some substantial portion of what they received from Subaru for the Show the Love campaign. We're uh, in talk with also using that to leverage other funds, uh, significant other funds. We think couple that with the funds we already have in the bank from uh, CPA in the town. 400,000 and some other private donations. It's a considerable amount, and, but we're still some deficit from what we think is the first phase required, and there's still ongoing conversations. Annie's been talking to David at the town that we're gonna have uh, conversations with the, uh, the gentleman uh, who's disputing the land ownership, Mr. Hannigan. We're gonna try to set those up and come to resolution there, knowing that we still have a deficit though, of uh, $100,000, $200,000, depending on how the design actually ends up. And so I think what we're talking about is going back to CPA, uh, which means we need to submit a, another proposal by the end of this year, calendar year. So it's coming up, what we do is submit a proposal, we'll figure out, work with Annie, and figure out the, what the final amount really is that we're requesting. But to make up that deficit so we can get that first phase completed, I think what we can show to CPA is, we've used your money to leverage a lot of other money, frankly, and uh, we just need them to close the loop so we can get this first phase completed. That would go on the, the spring town mm -hmm. warrant, right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully then that would be good, actually good timing for us to get projects going in the summer and fall. Anything to add to that, Chris? No, not really. Um, you know, at this point, we're just kind of in that holding pattern, I guess, yeah. until we uh, really know what's going on. Okay. I got a random. Uh, Thank you. The Barson Hopkins bas varsity basketball is playing at Ludlow. Nice. Um, and I will say this is the last face-to-face -face, uh, uh, school committee meeting I'll be at for until August. So I'll, I'll join by Skype. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to review of capital plan. Chris. Okay, I so said why this is on here is that if we wanted to have anything on the spring warrant, we need to let the town know by February first. I did clarify that the town typically expects to fund our capital plan at fall town meeting, not at any meeting. So that's usually, they wait till everything, but that's why, I, I, unless you looked at this and said, oh, no, 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 we want them to move off their schedule. I think it was part of, if there's something that you're saying, nope, we want you to put a warrant article to the town, we gotta do that by February. Sorry, I'm just gonna walk that's okay. this again. <laughs> And actually, you, you received two versions of this capital plan. The outdated version is in your packet, and then you received a second email with the current version. Um, so I'm referring to the current version. <laughs> um, and actually, I have a couple of suggestions, uh, if you don't mind. The first is that if we look at number three, the athletic fields phase two, 
At this point in time, it really appears that phase one, realistically, would probably be in year three, the 2019 to 2020. That's, I mean, I would imagine that's when we're going to, uh, to start phase one. It would really seem that phase two the following year is, is just way too soon. Um, and so I would recommend that we move that one out, you know, a certain amount of years. And, you know, Depends on I'm how sorry, you feel. Say again, what are we moving on? I was pulling up the new plan. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. All right, so number three, athletic yep. fields. Yep. You see, we have phase two under year four. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and what I'm thinking is that the phase one is going to be done in year three because we're not we're not going to get it done this year, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is actually year two on this report. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, our best hope would be that we'd get it done in year three. Okay. I just don't see it as a possibility to get phase two done in year four right. the following year. I mean, I would have to expect that there'd be some kind of funding or co-funding request by us again. Mm -hmm. And it would just seem to be very soon to start dipping into the well, uh, you know, again, to, to look for yeah. additional donations. So it just, just my take is that I would slide that out you know, at least a couple of years. Um, the other item on there is right above the girls' locker room remodel. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I, this is one of those items that's been, it's been on the capital plan for quite some time with a dollar amount that was given to us in 2009. Right. Uh, that, that dollar amount was 400,000. I finally just threw another 100,000 at it because I said, well, it's still going to be off, but my God, let's, let's Let's have some connection to reality here. You know, there's no way it's going to be anywhere near 400,000. Um, and I guess what I just need to know is when when were you looking to get this done? You know, I mean, we would need to get some kind of pricing estimate that would be legitimate for it. And again, it's one of those difficult things to do. We may actually have to pay somebody to give us some kind of pricing because if you were to ask a contractor and give them the you know, 50 pages of blueprints that we have for this project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to take them, you know, a few days to actually come up with an estimate. You can't just, you can't just expect them to do that and then, and then tell them, okay, thank you very much. Now we're going out to bid. You know, I mean, right. Right. It's, that would make them happy. So, you know, depending on, on when you'd like to see this done, um, you know, determines on whether or not it stays in year three or moves out to year four. Um, I mean, remodeling it in the summer seems least disruptive, but definitely. so as far as getting, I mean, getting an initial, we had this slated for the 1920 fiscal year. Right. So, I mean, would that kind of entail, okay, over the next, you know, in early 2019, we're trying to get some ideas about that. Uh, plans and better estimates, maybe we have to go out to bid. Well, we probably do have to go out to bid, like we were saying, for we, the final We would definitely project. have to go out to bid for the final project. Um, if we were to get pricing for it, we could reach out and get some kind of an estimate just to see how much it would right. cost to get pricing done. Um, and, you know, maybe it would be a small enough amount that we wouldn't even have to, uh, you know, formally go out and request proposals from three different vendors. Right. Um, but are we uh, thinking this summer or next summer? I think we're thinking this summer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then we would need to jump right on this yes. so that we'd have I a dollar so. amount for the... Which, if we're thinking this summer, that means we're submitting a new article for 2-1. Yes. So we're going outside of the town yeah. schedule. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the school bus replacement. Bus replacement and attack upgrades. And the, the school bus replacement should need to still be there. Uh, when we go out to bid, mm -hmm. we will ask for pricing as we did the last time for the current split that we have between the Hadley drivers and buses and the 
outside vendor uh, driving some of the routes, and we will also ask for pricing if the outside vendor just does the whole thing. Uh, and that way we can kind of weigh both options and see if it's cost effective for us to, you know, um, outsource the entire thing or if we want to keep it in house on a partial basis, in which case then, yeah, we would need the bus. If the bids come in and, and it's you know, fin financially beneficial to us to just outsource the whole thing, then we wouldn't need the bus. Um, okay. The tech upgrades, let me speak with Mike on that because he might not need that part of it. Um, Mike has gotten a lot of support from the trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, he gets a lot of support and the last item that he had on here, he said, oh no, you can take that out. I, I was able to pay for that out of the money that you know, these particular people gave me. And so he gets that a lot. So let me just check in with him uh, on whether or not we need that as well. Okay. For, for this particular, the 17.5, it's replaced the fiber optic wire from um, Hopkins to the admin building and add a second Chromebook cart to Hopkins Academy. So he may have already done some or all of that, so I can just check with him okay. and see what he's doing. Looking at that $69,000 expense in tech upgrades, are we aspiring for one-to-one -one scenario by that time? 69,000 is replace 80 Chromebooks in the district, re replace oldest classroom printers, 25 of them, Increase count of Chromebooks to provide one-to-one -one in Hopkins grades 9 to 12. Replace video projectors older than six years old. 25 of those. So some upkeep, but augmenting our current capacity to enable at least one-to-one -one in the um, high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you need from the capital plan? You got what you need for February? I'll recall David and say what exactly do we need prepared by when. Okay. All right. Uh, Chris, you ready to move into the business manager report? Sure. Okay. So, the expense report. Uh, I did some reclasses of expenses to grants, and I'm trying to just find it here. I printed a copy and then came over here and left it in the printers. <laughs> I'm going off the PDF. Oh, hey, look at that. Thank you. Uh, so some of these balances will reflect the fact that I uh, transferred out some expenses from the local budget that you see here into grant accounts. Um, and I will continue to do that just because the grant accounts in a lot of, and not just in Hadley, but basically statewide, were approved later this year than we've typically seen them which meant that we really didn't know how much money we were going to have. And it's kind of considered, I guess, a, a school finance no-no to charge to grants that you know you're gonna get, but you really haven't been formally approved yet. So because of that, we've kind of held off. Um, but as, as you can see, um, if you go on, on this report to page six of eight, uh, you can see the tuition accounts um, to non-public schools and to collaborative programs. You can see both of those are in the negative for available balance. Um, this is the, the kind of example, and actually even further down, the special ed transportation. This is um, the kind of thing that would be transferred to Circuit Breaker, uh, the 240 grant. And uh, as you'll see further in the grant report, we have about $350,000 in Circuit Breaker money and we have, I think, about another 91000 in the 240 grant. Um, so we're talking about, four, we'll just call it $440,000. And we have a shortfall here of 248 and 13, so about 260, about 330. So even though, again, when you look at a shortfall of a quarter of a million dollars, it's not to worry. That's actually just that we haven't yet moved all of those funds into the grant accounts. And in reality, I could move the entire amount, or you know, the entire amount that we intended to spend on the grant, but the grant administrators really don't like you to, in November or December, have used all of the grant funds. Uh, you know, they they like it to be spread out over the year. Sometimes, when when grant funds are a little bit in jeopardy, I like to spend them earlier rather than later, 
just because when the state recalls the grant and they say, okay, nobody is getting any more grant funds in this particular grant, or I know you planned on getting 20,000, but now you're only getting 15. Well, if we've already spent the 20, we get to keep it. You know? So it, there, there are good times to do that, but with something like circuit breaker money, that's already ours, and the 240 grant, you know, we get that every year. It's not in jeopardy at this time, certainly. So I'm just kind of spreading it out over time a little bit. But other than that, it's really not a lot. I mean, those, those were the big, you know, I, I say kind of quote shortfalls because they're really not shortfalls. Uh, other than that, everything is still lined up nicely. Uh, as you can see, we have about $3.3 .3 million to spend by the end of the year, and a lot of the items have already been encumbered for the year, so we're in good shape there. Anything else in the expense report? No. Any questions? No. Grant report you covered? Um, kind of, yeah. I mean, so, you know, I, uh, you can see for the special ed, I, I did transfer $69,000. So, yeah, we have $91,000 left there, uh, $352,000 in circuit breakers. So, you know, there are plenty of funds available there. Um, the health grant, I will start transferring uh, nurse salary money into that right now. All we've had were uh, conferences that they've gone to with supplies they bought, things like that. Um, so you'll see a good portion of that spent by the next report you see as well. Um, Title I was one of those grants that got approved, I believe, in early November. So this is one of those that, you know, I didn't want to transfer any money that we spent before it was approved. So rather than starting at the end of August and running out of Title I money by, say, March or April, we're starting in October and we'll run out of Title I money in June. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a wash either way. But just again, from the financial rule book, it's better to do it that way. Um, the bottom one, the 391, you can see that preschool learning environment. So that one's going away um, next year. That $17,000 that you see used, um, that will go back into the preschool revolving account. So I took the expenses out of preschool revolving and moved them into this grant. That is not reflected in the balance on the next page, which are the revolving accounts, because the town hasn't process them yet but also because this is as of november 30th and i did the transfers about on december 5th or so so you know i i could have added them in there but it's not you know again it's not really true for november 30th so that you can see it's down to thirty one thousand dollars but that's going to jump up to about 48 um, and then going forward now we will continue to pay lauren winner's uh, salary for the next you know, couple of months anyway until until the grant runs out of funds so that'll help you know, bring that balance up a little bit, which you know, certainly would be nice to see. Okay. I know I kind of I kind of jumped to another report, but it was just uh, you know kind of a comment there. Does anyone have any questions on the grant report? And then the revolving account. It's not the much. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> Since you're here. <laughs> an excellent question. Um, Again, you know, with the lunch account, I, I did include the state reimbursements that we got, but the actual, I guess for lack of a better term, cash register receipts that we've gotten were not posted yet by the town, so I don't have those yet. The cash register would, would be for both, uh, you know, what we've actually gotten in cash at the schools, plus any online payments that we've received. So those are not in there. Nevertheless, I mean, you know, this is this is something we see every year where that balance just, you know, we had that glorious moment in August where we had twenty five hundred dollars in the account, and I was uh, I was feeling pretty good about it. <laughs> that was the I knew it was short lived. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. we'll look forward to when all those receipts are posted. Yeah, I, I really wish we could just, you know. They weren't posted yet for the state reimbursements either, but I yeah. went on vendor women, at least I got those amounts, so I was able to put those in. Because actually the balance looked worse without those reimbursements. So. <laughs> All right, anything else for Chris? Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Chris. All right, um, let's look at many reports and discussion. 
policy. We're going to have a policy right. meeting. We are. There will be one. Well, it will be someday <laughs> soon. It so, is. Yeah. Sounds this like it'll be an ongoing joke in our office. Yeah. This time, we sent the agenda over and we put the wrong date on it. Sue <laughs> said today, they must think that I don't want them to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll send my availability too. Thanks for sending yours. So we'll get that squared away for January. Uh, finance tri board sounds like we talked about everything there and the recommendations. C capital and fields, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, collaborative, Mira. Yeah, two things about the collaborative. Um, earlier in the month, I forwarded you a letter written by the executive director uh, to the state regarding the uh, expansion of the charter school. All um, of the member districts uh, represented were represented in that letter, and it was a very well-written, mm -hmm. well-laid-out argument for why our region cannot support an expansion. Um, so I was really pleased with that, and that went nicely with the Hadley letter that you wrote for there, so thank you for doing that. Well, um, it, and it's specifically the collaborative letter, just to be clear, specifically named the member districts. That's right. Hadley was one of them, so that's glad that's to exactly. see we were on that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's one of the benefits of um, having that kind of organization that represents many of our interests. Yeah. Um, the other thing I shared with you is um, upcoming professional development opportunities that CES provides. There were some really interesting ones, particularly uh, around uh, the, that we might want to take advantage of as we attempt to create more out of school learning opportunities for our high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Uh, so there's there's that and there, there's a lot of um, there, there's another one on uh, trauma informed uh, uh, improving outcomes for students living in poverty and trauma and uh, I just wanted to mention that because NPR had a great segment about the Berkshires um, an area you don't think about for uh, any kind of anything related to trauma but. Uh, I urge everyone to listen to it because it really highlights the fact that uh, one in three children is living in, with something, no matter where they are, so here in Hadley to Berkshires. Uh, and this seems to be really um, important new uh, ways for schools to understand the whole child and the, the, the good and the bad and the ugly that the, the, the that everyone in, inherently brings and how you can work with them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're sending any uh, faculty to that, but that would be interesting. We do, and I'm glad you brought that up. One thing the collaborative did for us that we were really grateful for last fiscal year, we used a wonderful provider, but we, um, this district invested a considerable amount of money in a, in a provider, and that was just not sustainable for us to give us ongoing uh, ongoing PD around trauma-informed instruction. So we had it all last year. This year, Randy and Hatfield and Hadley got together and said, this was the cost of one district, but if all three districts did it, would you do this for the same cost? And the collaborative did. So teachers from all three districts went for additional training. Mm -hmm. so, that's terrific. Anything else? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's another meeting in January. Uh, unfortunately, it's the same week that I'm traveling, so oh, okay. I'm going to miss that, but I'll get the materials and send it on over to us. Great, thank you. All right, we have a few action items. Uh, approval of AP warrants submitted in November 2018. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve the AP warrants. Submit. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That. Yeah, so I think this vote will carry because it's a because it's the quorum of who's here. We'll try okay. it. If it says it doesn't, you'll see the same motion. Okay. Next month. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, approval of the November 19, 2018 minutes. Is there a motion? A motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And approval of the warrants submitted in November of 2018. Move to approve the warrants. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, our next meeting date, uh, we'll plan on January 28th uh, at 5.30. I will check with Tara to see if she's available, uh, as Paul will be attending remotely in Umara, you're out of town, so we need three people here. Uh, and it looks like we've got the budget, the cap capital plan, and long-term special ed program evaluation planning on the agenda. 
Right. Um, that's the week of the 28th, right? Yes, okay. and summative of the um, If it needed to change, the week before, uh, I am around. Okay, good. You know that Monday is a holiday, but we could pick a different day that week if right. we need to do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And are we going into executive session? We are not. So, um, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Great, thank you.